Welcome to Latter-day Peace Studies presents Come Follow Me. On this podcast, we'll be discussing nonviolent readings of Latter-day Saint scripture. I'm Dan, and I'm joined by my wife and co-host, Marianne. The Latter-day Peace Studies Project is born out of a desire to proclaim peace by providing an opportunity to approach religion, scripture, and relationships with God in a peaceful way. As we develop peace within ourselves first, we can reflect peace into the world around us. The Latter-day Peace Studies Presents Come Follow Me podcast seeks to assist listeners in their approach to scripture by providing nonviolent interpretation. Our hope is that we can integrate the teachings of the scriptures into our efforts to find peace within ourselves and proclaim peace in the world. Thank you for joining us this week on Latter-day Peace Studies Presents Come Follow Me. I'm Dan. And I'm Mary Ann. And this week we're moving to a new book. We get out of 1st Nephi and we get 2nd Nephi, which I'll admit growing up, I was kind of like, why don't you just have the one Nephi? (laughs) Nephi separated it himself. So that's a good question for him. And I think there's a handful of interesting theories as to why that is. But clearly there's something going on with sort of the big long sermons that he does, right? And we've got the the blessing from Lehi, those sorts of things. But, you know, I, I think um, reading this Grant Hardy annotated version, he had a real interesting suggestion that First Nephi is a big focus on physical deliverance. Now, it doesn't not have spiritual deliverance, but of the two books, First Nephi is more pro, more primarily focused on physical deliverance, whereas Second Nephi has a larger focus on spiritual deliverance. And considering the amazing sermons that we get about the atonement and some of like the rich atonement theology that we pull out of second Nephi, I think that that is a pretty persuasive case. The other thing that happens in second Nephi is that, well, basically there's only two historical things that happen in second Nephi. First we have Lehi's death and then we have Nephi's escaping into the wilderness, reminding us of, the last time that he went to the wilderness. And again, another little exodus. And not the last exodus that we'll see in the Book of Mormon. We're obviously going to deal with Isaiah. Sort of lightly touched on Isaiah last time. This is interesting because, again, the sanitative version, one of the things they brought up was that Nephi kind of goes out of his way to ignore standard Christian proof texts in Isaiah. Like, uh, you know, the the verse is about uh, a virgin shall conceive, right? Instead, Nephi focuses on God's covenants with Israel, and we've got a lot of focus on Christ's role as Redeemer, and not just personal Savior, but above and beyond to sort of redeeming the nation of Israel. There's a lot else in in sort of the suggestions of Grant Hardy from the annotated version, but it seems like we might be getting a little bit of Nephi's midlife crisis, right? There's times when Nephi is, you know, Nephi's psalm is deeply sad and emotional, and yet at the same time, there there's optimism and hope. And really the end of Second Nephi does change some of the tenor, suggesting some, some optimism, right? After we get a little injection of enthusiasm from Jacob as well. But again, we like First Nephi, we have another header translated from the plates uh, right at the beginning of the book. And this is also the, the last we'll hear from Nephi, and he goes out of his way to talk about his making the small plates and his hopes for the future. There's a bunch of like notable things in that we don't get them noted. Like Nephi doesn't mention his wife or his kids or Sam kind of drops out of the picture after Sam's blessing. Joseph, his little brother kind of falls out after a few prophecies and we mostly get Jacob. So uh, there's a lot that, that is notable in its absence here, but it's a reminder maybe of Nephi's stated purpose in making this record. I did also find it really interesting that that in Nephi's little overview of the book, especially since the one before first Nephi is so long, like he puts quite a bit in that one. And this one's very short. And he doesn't mention Isaiah. Like he doesn't talk about the prophecies of Isaiah to our people or anything like that. He does he doesn't mention Isaiah at all in the overview, which is funny because I don't know what the percentages are, but a good half or more of Second Nephi is just quotations from Isaiah. It's definitely interesting. Nephi apparently just wanted to give people, you know, the historical context before delving in. And delving in, I mean, chapter one is really a continuation of the last chapter from First Nephi. And I think may maybe a little bit 
disproves my theory on uh, you know who who the last couple chapters were directed to. But I think there's. I thought you know, that was funny. I I noticed that when I read too, and wondered if you had seen that. <laughs> it's it's one of those things where maybe sometimes you just need to read ahead one chapter, <laughs> and uh, your sort of uh, questions or theories might get uh, you know dashed right. out of the water. But I still think that a lot of the concerns that Nephi has are are not specifically Laman and Lamuel, right? right? Clearly, he is going to be concerned about Jacob and Joseph, and he, he does set them apart as, you know, preachers, teachers. you know, uh, as, as yeah. teachers among his people. And we're going we're gonna to touch a little bit more on that, I think, either this week or next week. I have started studying ahead, so some things are blending <laughs> together. <laughs> but, um, yeah. I don't know. Is there anything about this uh, this transition to Lehi's blessing that you that was on your mind? Well, just that um, specifically, so it's, it says in verse one, our father Lehi also spake many things unto my brethren and rehearsed unto them how great things the Lord had done for them and bringing them out of the land of Jerusalem and spake unto them concerning their rebellions upon the waters and the mercies of God and sparing their lives. So that, that makes it really clear just to be specific that last time it had seemed like maybe in first Nephi chapter 22, that, that the audience could have just been Jacob and Joseph, but this makes it pretty clear that Laman and Lemuel are, are also included because Lehi is reminding them of their rebellions and then how merciful the Lord had been in warning them. And just every time I see mercy in the book of Mormon, even not, even if it's not tender mercies, Merciful is always going to bring to mind that that verb rahamim, which is the tenderness of of a parent for their child, and so I just that that will always strike me when I see that word. Lehi also says in verse four that he's seen another vision and knows for sure that Jerusalem has been destroyed. So he's continuing to have visions. That's still one of his modes. As a response to the the comment on mercy, that's a really good point because one of the things that as I've been thinking about you, your commentary on that is that in Moroni 10, verse 3, this is, you know, the, the promise that Moroni gives right at the end. He says, when you re- read these things, if it be wisdom and God that you read them, that you would remember how merciful the Lord hath been unto the children of men and ponder it in their hearts. And the verse four, you know, is exhort you that you would ask God, the eternal father, in the name of Christ, if these things are not true. And... I can't remember exactly where I heard it, but someone suggested that the things that we're asking about are not specifically the Book of Mormon, but the mercies that the Lord has shown under the children mm. of men. And so Moroni is kind of making the case of, did this record prove the mercy of God, right? You need to ponder that and pray. And if that's true, well, then that there you go. That's your answer. Just an interesting way to approach that, I think. Yeah. They also get the uh, yeah after the after the news about uh, Jerusalem, there's a, a big focus on the the land of promise, right? The covenanted land. I found it interesting that in the original manuscript or, may, or maybe the printer's manuscript, I, I have a note that says oh, but when he says yea, the Lord hath covenanted this land unto me, in the that manuscript that covenanted was consecrated, which I think is interesting because those two seem very very similar sort of parallel ideas. And uh, obviously, I think, you know, as you're scribing, maybe phonetically, it's pretty easy to sort of mix mix those up. But the Lord covenanted with me, and then the Lord has consecrated this land. That sort of parallelism kind of fits nicely. And I don't know if that's necessarily what Lehi was going for. To me, that, that works. I was struck by verse 7 as I was reading through. Did you have something you wanted to say before 7? Verse six, I think this this is, you know, in the spirit of Ben and Christopher's sort of, um, let's say, problematizing some some scriptures. Verse six is an interesting one. The the last phrase that there shall none come into this land save they shall be brought by the hand of the Lord. You know, does this mean that everyone who comes into the the Americas, and I assume that means all of North and South America, given what Joseph Smith said about Zion, does that mean that everyone is brought by the hand of the Lord? Well, okay, well, what do we mean by hand of the Lord? That's also used when describing Joseph in Egypt um, in 1 Nephi 5.14, where it talks about him being preserved by the hand of the Lord. It's also the language used to describe the Liahona in Mosiah, where it says it was prepared by the hand of the Lord. And so I was kind of wondering, you know, given some of the history of how certain peoples were brought to America, and obviously there are people that you can look and say, 
you know, I, if if God's the one bringing them, then I kind of have some questions for God. Mm-hmm. First off, maybe that's a maybe that's more of an issue with judgment on me for that second part. But I wonder if it is more if it's less about geography and more about the idea of this consecration and covenant that there is the mundane, you know, geolocation of the land. You know, you have the coordinates, right? The light long, but there's also the divine cosmic location of the covenanted land. And and so that two people can walk on the same land, maybe take the same trail, but because of their relation to the covenant, one is being brought by the hand of God into this land, meaning the covenanted land. And the other is simply having an afternoon hike. Now, I don't know that Lehi had that in mind. I don't know that that's the intent of the translation, but to me, that speaks significance to God's working in our lives. Yeah. I, I think that relates to what struck me about verse seven, that that it's, you know, the promise that we find many times throughout the Book of Mormon, that if it so be that they shall serve him according to the commandments which he hath given, it shall be a land of liberty unto them. For in, if iniquity shall abound, cursed shall be the land for their sakes, but unto the righteous it shall be blessed forever. And just kind of trying to tease out a little bit, what does that promise actually mean? Because Nephi is righteous and the land is blessed for him and for many of his descendants, but not in perpetuity. Like some of his descendants lose that blessing and some of Laman and Lemuel's descendants reverse that blessing. But it also doesn't seem to be, you know, directly tied to not struggling, not having hardships, having progeny who will all survive or that your children will always be righteous or like, what does the land being blessed to us really mean? Like what, what of that promise can we really trust in if we know that it doesn't mean everything's going to come easy for us? Yeah. The, the first phrase of, of seven also, wherefore this land is consecrated unto him whom he shall bring, you know, again, is that, is that a logical procession there? Is it saying that the Lord consecrated it and then he's going to bring people? Or is he saying the people who the Lord brings to this land, for them, it's consecrated. They're going to treat it as something made sacred, right? So that the orientation is not on a map, but in our hearts. Mm. Then that's something available to us now, but is all in our, our attitude right? It might not change what we actually do, but our attitude about what we do can make all the difference. Yeah. And Lehi's also got to be sitting there and saying, well, yes, we were brought by the hand of the Lord and I have Nephi and Sam and Jacob and Joseph, and I also have Laman and Lamuel. So clearly Lehi is not thinking, yeah, everyone who the Lord brings over here is going to be perfectly righteous and follow his commandments for everything. Or even happy about it. Yeah. Um, the idea is, I, I think it just comes down to the idea of covenant and consecration. And that's why, you know, I mean, I don't, I'm not, I don't have anyone's ear on the uh, church's uh, publication committee, but I really think that, that we need both words in there. Mm, that's a good idea. I like that because the, the covenant is more of the formal, right? Promise making and consecrated right. is your attitude toward holding that thing sacred. And hopefully the two always go together, but it doesn't, mean they're synonymous. And one is the contract, one's the enforcement mm-hmm. or, or the, the result of the contract. Right. Verse eight, I mean, okay, I, I, we can't, <laughs> I don't think we can get away every week with doing a verse by verse, but that's how I've been studying. That's and what and we've said I will every say week. It's been, <laughs> I know it's, it's been super rewarding for me to study verse by yeah. verse and pull on a lot of things. Verse, okay, verse eight, if I can dip I know I said, I, I think I said at the beginning, you know, I won't get into po- apologetics, but I think I kind of did. I got a, I didn't spend all of, you know, high school and most of college on my mission. You did. Um, you did. Getting really into it to, to not sort of uh, address some of the, the more contentious mm. or or subtle arguments. For example, in, in verse eight, you know, it's wisdom that this land should be kept as yet from the knowledge of other nations. Uh, for behold, many nations would overrun the land. Some people have used this to suggest that they got there and the land was unpopulated, but I don't think that's, I mean, that makes sense why why you would assume that. I'm not saying it's that that assumption is is wrong, but I think Brant Gardner, he has some Book of Mormon commentaries and he's got some very interesting thoughts on what Nephi is defining as, as nations, right? That sometimes we focus a little too much on 
sort of the geography and not so much the uh, political boundaries. But, you know, he, he says that uh, Lehi's perception of the world was probably m smaller than our modern understanding and that lands and nations were much more localized. And so that a nation could come from another part of, he's a Mesoamerican model enthusiast. So he, he says, you know, they could come from another part of Mesoamerica and still overrun their local land. So this is one where I think historically you might just say, okay, well, yeah, you know, they didn't really know about North America until they got here. And we had a fun, actually, it's kind of funny. We were listening to Poison for Breakfast, the, I think, most recent Lemony Snicket book. And he has a little bit in there about the European uh, settlement of America, the colonization of America. And um, it, it is humorous. Uh, I'll say that. Worth a, worth a listen, by the way, that book. Very funny. And surprisingly ties into a little bit of this. So, uh, But skipping ahead, <laughs> we, we get Lehi's commentary about the, the dwindling and unbelief. And so at this point, it appears that he did have knowledge of that. Again, whether it's uh, from Nephi or from uh, his own vision of the Tree of Life or whether it's you know some other vision or revelation he's had, he, he is aware that uh, that is coming for the, the future. Tied to that idea in verse 18, skipping ahead just a little bit, but that he is talking to his rebellious sons about his anxiety for them. And that he's, he talks about his anxiety and his sorrow and his fear that a, in verse 18, he references a cursing that should come upon the space, come upon you for the space of many generations. And what does he say? The cursing is being visited by the sword and famine and being hated and like violence and destruction is the cursing. It's uh, not related to their physical appearance. It is related to death and suffering. And so that's what he's concerned that the curse is, is that not following the commandments of the Lord is going to lead to greater suffering in their lives. So, and then, and then in verse 21, when he talks about that, he's, he's hoping to have joy and that he can leave leave this world with gladness because of you, that I might not be brought down with grief and sorrow. And just that he's describing all of these like feelings of his heart. This is not really a logical argument. This is very much geared toward the things that he's been feeling. He's really sharing his heart with his sons, which is another another tender insight into Lehi's character there. Yeah, I think his pleading with them, you know, I think he he gives a lot of sort of invectives. So that's the right word, invectives, when he says, oh, that you would awake, awake from a deep sleep, even the sleep of hell, shake off the awful chains by which you're bound, which are the chains which bind the children of men, and they are carried down captive into the eternal gulf of misery and woe. Awake and arise from the dust. Yeah, and hear the words of a trembling parent that, um, you know, that's certainly evocative of of um, his his emotional appeal which um, might contrast to Nephi's more sort of logical speaking. He's just thinking about that, you know, Nephi's, when he addresses, he's sort of like, well, you know, this means this, and this means this, and this is the history, and, you know, the branch gets broken off, and that's us, and we come here, and then we go back. I guess you could say Nephi's a very black and white thinker, and Lehi seems to be a little more of a creative, you know, a little, a little L more intuitive. Little bit. I don't know. A little bit. I know invective is not the right word. Is there injunction? I think I think I meant injunction. Mm, yes. Um, is that right? You could where, also where say you're pleading with exhortation. Someone? Exhortation. Yeah, I think invective is like an insult. So apologies to our editors if you have to cut that out or um, just explain that. Uh, sometimes I get words mixed they're up. They're just going to let you explain yourself close. on that one, babe. Yes. Hope, well, hopefully, <laughs> you know, all our audience is not just shunned me for my... Um, grammatical and linguistic uh, <laughs> failings. There's, yeah, there's so much, you know, I, I don't know how many times he asks them to awake, but it's it's present here quite a few times. And that is kind of an interesting thought considering the, the conception of Sheol in, in Hebrew mm -hmm. thought, where, you know, the grave was thought of place of death was seen more like sleeping, like, like sleeping was a kind of small death, mm -hmm. right? Because you're, you're unconscious. People are just, you're, you're just unconscious. And so spiritually, Laman and Lemuel are dead, right? They are asleep. And so he's begging them to wake up because, and while Sheol is not 
uh, one-to-one correlated with hell, it's clear that some of the conceptions of Sheol have influenced the Christian conception of hell, um, or at least has evolved and grown into that understanding. And so Lehi, I got to imagine he's thinking back to his dream, right? Where he sees this eternal gulf and he's just begging them to wake up that they can take the steps that they need to away from it and that they can come to the tree, right? Yeah. Well, because he wants to prevent their suffering. I guess you could say I'm a bit of a universalist. I'm not certain that Laman and Lemuel don't have a chance. Because as we talked about in right. the in the, the vision that Lehi has, Laman and Lemuel never even get to partake of the fruit of the tree. They don't even know what they're missing. Therefore, their accountability is not the same. Accountability is more of a continuum, I think. And none of us have perfect accountability because no one has a perfect knowledge of everything that every choice that they make will entail. There are always unintended consequences from choices that we make, even when they're made with the best of intentions. There are always things that are going to pop up and other people have their agency. And just because we made a right choice doesn't mean it's going to lead to good things because we live in a fallen world. That's, that's part of our mortality is that there's not always an immediate one-to-one correlation. So I, I think that, to me personally, Layman and Lemuel still have a chance. Well, I don't think there's anyone who doesn't think that that's the case. Although it's interesting because, yeah, you know, he, he wants to prevent them from further suffering. But he also wants to prevent Nephi from further suffering. If you yes, go to yes. verse uh, 25... Uh, he's talking about Nephi and they're, you know, they're taking away his life and he fears and trembles because he thinks that Nephi is going to suffer again. Mm-hmm. Right. And he's not wrong. Like any loving parent. He just wants his kids to yeah. get along. Right. Yes. It's, uh, it's definitely tough, but he's not, uh, he's also not, you know, mincing words in terms mm-hmm. of trying to play both sides of the children's opinions. Mm-hmm. Right. He's, he says, no, no, no. Ne- Nephi is correct. I understand that he speaks with sharpness. Maybe that sharpness isn't just like directive, but also sort of that cold calculating logic. <laughs> you, you think he's angry with you, but, you know, he, he's not angry. He, he, he's telling the truth, mm. right? And the guilty take the truth to mm. be hard. Yeah, I think it's, it's really powerful to me that the Book of Mormon begins with the story of a family that is imperfect and that Nephi and Sam and Jacob and Joseph and Laman and Lemuel – We're all raised in the same home. I mean, many years apart, (laughs) which we all know can also make a difference, but that they had the same parents and that they were taught the same things and had many of the same experiences and yet made such different choices. And does that mean that Lehi and Sariah are failed parents? Because they had children who repeatedly chose, not just chose not to embrace the message of the gospel and embrace a relationship with God, they rejected family bonds and sought their brother's life and at times sought their father's life. Those are some big family wounds to carry around. I think that any parent who is grieving a difficult relationship with their children can can find comfort and solidarity with Lehi and Sariah that they were chosen people and still encountered difficulty and still had sorrow and still we still have to allow for other people's agency. And so other people's choices are not a reflection on us. We have to allow them the space to make their own decisions. Yes. And again, to sort of underscore this point, Lehi tells them, look, I'm leaving you a blessing, right? Now, you have to listen to Nephi to get this blessing. And I don't think that he's saying that Nephi is the custodian of the blessing. I think what he's saying is, I know that Nephi is going to teach the right things. And so if you listen to him, you're not going to lose access to the blessings that, that are coming, you know, predicated upon what you do. Obviously, we, we know how that worked out historically. But uh, again, he gave the blessing. He wanted them to, to receive those things. Yeah. I did think it was really interesting as I was reading through here when he's when he's talking about his blessing at the end of verse 28. And if you will hearken unto him, unto Nephi, I leave unto you a blessing, yea, even my first blessing. So Nephi is the leader. He's he's going to be the de facto leader no matter what. So his first blessing is not necessarily the birthright. It's not the same thing because if it were 
classified as the birthright, you know, layman would be the leader of their family. So clearly the first blessing and the birthright are not the same thing. They're not equal. And so Nephi is getting the, I guess you could say, patriarchal or priesthood leadership over the family, but he still offers Laman and Lemuel this first blessing. So it just made me wonder about like, what what would this first blessing entail, especially if after he was dead, he wasn't there to enforce it as far as like property or something like that. Yeah, I saw in some of the commentaries suggesting that it was sort of like, not like a birthright type of thing, but that it was just the first blessing that he was saying, mm. right? And that there may have been like a, a secondary sort of conditional thing that was uh, either not recorded or just sort of implied. Because this isn't just Laman and Lamuel, it's also Sam and the sons of Ishmael, right? That's true. That's true. And so, or that maybe this first blessing relates back to the, if you're righteous, you will prosper. If you're not, you'll be destroyed. Mm, so Good point. Okay, that clarifies it a little bit for me. There is still, I think, some interesting ambiguity there, and it may be just contextually we don't have access to those sorts mm -hmm. of things. But I'd be I'd be curious to to know if anyone had some more insider feedback. But one more thing in Second Nephi one, in verse thirty, we have Zoram, right? Um, who has not been in the story much since he joined, but we have him being referred to as a true friend unto Nephi forever. And that uh, phrase, true friend, if you go check out, you know, the Hebrew Bible and even in our Doctrine and Covenants, the phrase, you know, friend, being called a friend is is not just like a guy that you like, you know, who you hang out with. You maybe, maybe go grab dinner or watch a game, that sort of thing. No, it's a covenant language, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's someone who you embrace as a friend and, you know, the Lord... Doctrine and Covenants refers to several people as friends, right? Mm -hmm. And that's sort of the step beyond just like follower, right? Yeah. You are, you've moved from follower to friend, and that implies a covenantal progression, I'd say. And that reminds you of uh, sort of the, the promise that Zora made, right? He swore to, to Nephi, mm -hmm. so. That's also interesting considering Joseph Smith used that language in a letter to Emma as he signed a letter to her when he was in, I believe when he was in Liberty Jail as your only true and living friend, Joseph. That's kind of sweet. And then we move to chapter two. <laughs> this is, man, this is this is as rich as it gets. This is one of the most doctrinally rich chapters in all of the Book of Mormon. There's incredible depth here, and I have, I can't believe it's only one chapter. <laughs> and at the same time, I want so much more. <laughs> yes. And it's so interesting because Lehi opens with, and now, Jacob, I speak unto you. And then he's going to spend most of the rest of the chapter really addressing sort of everybody. And he's giving this, you know, amazing doctrinal sermon that has impacted, at least with LDS theology, I think it's been one of the most impactful chapters. You know, it's it's definitely got to be in t like top 10 most referenced chapters in conference and always a always a highlight. But. I still think it's funny that Lehi at first says, Jacob, I speak unto you. And then by verse 30, he says, I've spoken these words unto all of you, my sons. And so you can kind of imagine it. the idea of everyone gathered around as Lehi is giving his blessings and being so filled with the spirit that he can't help but deliver these universal truths. Getting into chapter two, I would be remiss not to mention in verse two, you know, the, nevertheless, Jacob, my first born in the wilderness, Thou knowest the greatness of God, and he shall consecrate thine affliction for thy gain. You know, Jordan Peterson always talks about, you know, the basis of reality being suffering, right? That's, that's, that's the one thing that you can't argue against in terms of what is true and real. He, he, he references that. And universal. And universal, right? Sort of as a um, repost to the nihilist. He says, well, okay, nothing has any meaning. Well... Sure, but can you deny that suffering is real, right? Like, if if you're going to deny that it's real, then then what, what do you? How can you really consistently do that logically? And you know, obviously, I'm paraphrasing and and butchering some of this interpretation, but I think it's interesting that you know th this idea that consecrating afflictions for gain is something that God is really good at doing. That thought is one that I don't want to necessarily put on everyone who's suffering 
right? In the moment, obviously, I think it's not necessarily the most useful. And so probably Jacob has not felt those afflictions for some time. But the idea being that when we examine our afflictions, there's nothing that we can't turn to God with and that he can't turn into good and gain for yeah. us. That especially, I think we really need to be clear about how God does not cause the terrible things that happen in our lives, but that right. if we turn to him with those terrible things, that he can make something really beautiful out of them. As sort of an example of this that is not someone's personal life, I think about the Provo Tabernacle and how many years ago, not that many years ago, actually, it, it feels like not long, but it's actually been quite a while, but it was a beautiful historic building in downtown Provo. I attended a state conference there. They had lots of concerts there. Like it was this amazing building that has been built by the pioneers and it had beautiful history attached to it. And it was just this incredible historical building. And there was a fire that just ripped through the whole building and destroyed most of it. And the church was left wondering what to do with the remnants. There were some things left, but not very much. They decided to put the work and effort into making it a temple. And so it's now the Provo City Center Temple. And I, I don't think that God caused that fire to happen. I don't think that fire was set by an angel or even that the Lord like caused someone to, you know, leave a lantern burning or something that was not his plan was to burn down the Provo Tabernacle. But once that happened, because we live in a mortal world where things can burn, he was able to take that terrible thing and make it into something that was beautiful. And the fire was still terrible and the damage was still really disheartening. And it was still a great cause for grief among people who had memories there and people who'd helped to care for it and restore it and all of those things. So it doesn't, it doesn't negate all of that grief of losing the tabernacle, but that there is also new life. There is also good things waiting on the other side. There's nothing barren that God can't make fruitful. There's nothing terrible that he can't make wonderful. I think is, is the point. We get some more blessings specific, sort of specifically towards Jacob, where Lehi talks about, you know, I know that thy, thou art redeemed because of the righteousness of thy Redeemer, for thou hast beheld in the fullness of time he cometh to bring salvation unto men. This is an interesting sort of look forward into the future. Might be sort of a, a reference to, he, he references a little bit later, the idea that maybe Jacob has, has seen Jesus in, ver, in vision. But there's also, when he talks about uh, earlier in verse 3, thy day shall be spent in the service of, of thy God. Might be a reference to Jacob becoming a priest, right? Being consecrated to a priest and his serving in the Nephite temple. This uh, this idea is his support. I think John Welch talks a little bit more about it. And obviously we, we get a lot from Jacob uh, in Second Nephi. And there's a lot to say that even if we just have the record of his sermons, right? These sermons are, are beautiful and are clear evidence of his dedication to, to God. And this is also, yeah, in, in verse four, uh, and thou hast beheld in thy, thy youth his glory, wherefore thou art blessed even as they unto whom he shall minister into the flesh. So again, this sort of looking forward into the future while also being here now. And this is where we move into some of the more doctrinal things. But one of the things that struck me is uh, Lehi's kind of getting a little bit into soteriology here, right? The doctrines of salvation, because he says, I know that thou art redeemed because of the righteousness of thy redeemer, right? Which is a um, interesting way to say that you're saved by grace, right? Through through faith, which is an interesting take, considering that we, we get not too long from now, we get uh, one of the more famous phrases, the, uh, you know, after all you can do, which has been used to sort of suggest the whole works derived faith or works derived salvation rather. Although when we get there, we'll take apart that, uh, that myth. And then verse four, you know, he says, uh, the spirits the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the way is prepared from the fall of man and salvation is free. 
So there you go. It is a free gift, right? And he's going to spend the rest of the chapter talking about salvation and God and so many more things that tie back into this idea. And a little bit of, well, how can salvation be free and people not still pick it, right? Uh, if, if it's free, why doesn't everyone grab some? Just take take that salvation. So we're, we're going to learn a little bit more about that. Any thoughts here before we before we get into the meaty verses? Just that I have I have always loved this chapter. I have not always known what all of it means. I don't I don't claim that my love means I understand it all, but it it is this chapter that definitely speaks to me. I love that he begins it in verse five by saying men are instructed sufficiently that they know good from evil. And I think it's important that the word sufficiently is not perfectly, that we don't perfectly understand all the implications of our choice, like I was saying earlier, but enough to have some accountability, enough to be able to understand some cause and effect, right? And the the longer that we live, the more cause and effect we understand, hopefully, that we that we gain wisdom and we start to understand more of how everything is connected. We are hopefully more careful in our choices and um, more thoughtful. But this experiment on earth, this situation that we are in, we're given sufficient instruction that it's, it's enough. It's not perfect, but it's enough. Yes. I know that he loveth his children. Nevertheless, I don't know the meaning of all things to hearken back the phrase, you know, that they know good from evil. I don't think that this is, um, it's interesting that he says good from evil, right? Men are instructed to know the difference, right? But not necessarily the totality of both. Again, that that's sort of sufficient. Like you don't actually have to go about doing evil just to, you know, know how it feels. <laughs> you can get, get a pretty good assessment of that without having to, to do too much. The, the phrase by the law, men are cut off. And yea, by the temporal law, they were cut off. And also by the spiritual law, they perished from that, which is good. It struck me as almost like a, a deep irony, because in the Old Testament, we have this idea of when you when you go to make a covenant, right? It, it, the idea is the, the cutting a covenant uh, is, is the phrase. And so that, that Hebrew tradition, you know, the covenant of the law, to cut a covenant, to start that, making the, the covenant is, is sort of this evidence of the severing right which creates the great white gulf so it's it's almost that in the making of the the covenant the mosaic law and how it was delivered it showed to people how they were cut off which is i don't know there, there's something deep and rich there and there's a lot in here that kind of reminded me of romans right some of the ideas that paul brings out uh, about sin entering the cosmos and uh, through through Adam's choice and the law being a, a, a school teacher to bring us to Christ or maybe that was Hebrews um, but th- there's some there's definitely I think more you know higher Christology in here this is going to be again where we get sort of the the deep nature of agency and atonement and and so many rich wonderful things and of course verse six wherefore redemption cometh in and through the holy messiah for he is full of grace and truth i mean just a perfect encapsulation of so much of the atonement again maybe this is a little bit back to jacob because he says he offered himself a sacrifice for sin and so if jacob is going to minister in the temple right he's going to be carrying out sacrifices and he's going to be enacting these prefiguring of prefigurements of Christ's great and last sacrifice so that hopefully Lehi is is orienting Jacob here to teach him not just what he's doing but what 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 he's doing means right i think that that is a, a potential understanding of this and again, in verse eight, we give we get this idea: no flesh can dwell in the presence of God, save it be through the merits and mercy and grace of the Holy Messiah. So again, we just have a little another another little um, leg chopped off from the works based salvation with this phrase here. Also, the first fruits. You know, I okay, I've been speaking a lot, but I want to I want to take an opportunity to say that the first fruits is is the best you have, right? It's the best and, and most beloved. It's the prize. It, this is Nibley points out, you know, it's, it's it couldn't be anything less than than your best. And it made me think about, you know, I, I have a few fruit trees, mostly fig trees. And every year when those figs are growing and 
just growing and they take, it seems like forever to ripen. And so that first fig is just, I, I always get so excited and grab it. And I, usually I, I do sometimes want to share it with you, but uh, usually <laughs> I wind up eating it all myself. Did you see that there are a couple figs on the fig tree in our garage that we pulled in from the freeze? I did. I don't think those yes. will ripen. I don't think <laughs> but, so, but uh, they're there. They it's are. Still, it's still going. Yep. I also... It was also noteworthy to me that in, in verse 8, I think, you can correct me if I'm wrong, or maybe the listeners can correct me, that's the first mention of the resurrection in the Book of Mormon. So before when Nephi was having his visions about the mission and life of Jesus Christ, he conspicuously, to me, left out the resurrection. He talks about his death, but he doesn't say resurrection. But here, Lehi teaches about the resurrection of the dead. And then I, th I think that might be the first mention. I mean, we are still fairly early in the Book of Mormon, but, but I find it interesting that for a book all about Jesus Christ, that it takes to page 57 of our current pagination <laughs> to, to talk about the resurrection, which is the you know crowning event of the atonement and therefore of human history. Yes, and we are. You are correct that this is the first time that resurrection is mentioned. I just want to shout out to actually University of Michigan uh, for their Book of Mormon simple searches. If you uh, if you just search Book of Mormon simple searches, it's um the the church website and the Gospel Library. It's a good search, but it's also uh, I don't know exactly what algorithm they use, but sometimes it gets you to the wrong things, or it doesn't really focus on the word. But if you go to this University of Michigan, you search for the word, and it shows you every single instance of the word from start to finish, and you don't have to sort through books or conference talks or anything else. Highly recommend for your study of the Book of Mormon. I think the church's website is probably more focused on, you know, ease of, of study from, you know, because they have like a different yes. web page for each chapter of the Book of Mormon. Well, each chapter in the standard works, really. And so there is a way to search, but I think it's more complicated because you're searching several different pages. Whereas if you have the text all in one place, it's easier for the computer to search, I would guess. I don't know. I'm not a techie, yes. but... <laughs> I, I think I think you're you're correct, but for my purposes, I I really like this uh, simple search because again that was where I was able to search you know hand of God and uh, come up with yeah. the other references just uh, as and so I can endorse <laughs> it at least for for people who are interested in something like that. We get more here in nine and ten that are again crescendoing into the peak where it says, you know, he, he shall make intercession for all children of men and they that believe in him shall be saved. And because of the intercession for all, all men come unto God, which is again, something that is expressed in Romans, right? Um, that sometimes we miss as we read, uh, especially if you're reading sectarianally, <laughs> if that's right. Uh, Secularly? Well, no, but uh, to to um, justify your sect's belief about, uh, uh, again, salvation yes. and works and grace and that sort of thing. But they, this idea of all men coming unto God, standing in the presence of him, you know, this, this universal redemption from death that we all experience because of the resurrection. And then this opportunity to be judged according to, you know, the, the law, right? And if we have chosen him as our advocate we we get him to answer for us and we move into this sort of logical almost logical but again it's not as logical as um as you might suspect just just given its format there is a lot of emotional understanding in there right it's not it's not necessarily a set of propositions although he does get into propositions a point but there there's a lot of sort of it's very poetic mm -hmm. uh, in how he's phrasing this. Intuitive, you might say. More intuitive than strictly logical. Yes. Appealing to how, how your intuition might work instead of your, your logical brain. Yes. One of the commentaries I, I, I had sort of brought this up, that uh, Lehi's intercession is, is Christ's atonement rather than a pleading before God because of the intercession all men come unto God. And when we arrive before him, uh, it is he who judges us according to the truth and holiness which is in him. His judgments are not based on Christ's pleading your case, so maybe uh, against what I'm saying a little bit. But once we are able to stand before God, judgment is based on our own merits. And again, this is where I'm like, 
is that really what they're saying? So you, you uh, every once in a while I'll come upon these commentaries where they put things in into Lehi's mouth, and maybe they do understand it better than I do, but I'm not sure that that's actually all of what Lehi's saying. But I do want to say that there there's more than one way to, way to read the scriptures, and so you can still read into this, you know, some... I don't, I don't think that Lehi's saying, hey, your works don't matter, right? But I think he's not saying that, hey, if you don't get your works up... You're not going to uh, make it, right? He's under no uh, impression about who is the one doing the saving. So yeah. just, a, just a little cautionary note for our listeners as they, well, as they listen to us, right? <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> nothing that we say is, um, these reflect all of our own views and opinions. And my opinion may change from week to week. So I don't even uh, endorse what I'm saying right now. <laughs> <laughs> but... Moving into this uh, next part, you know, the, this uh, verse 11 it needs to be that there's an opposition in all things, right? The suggestion that opposition is needed to bring to pass righteousness. So the things need to be a compound in one. I think the way that I read this early in life, I thought that the compound in one was like a good thing. <laughs> but I think that Lehi is trying to make uh, the case that the, the compound in one is a bad thing, right? And Obviously, that's kind of obvious to me now, but when he's talking about this compound in one, if it should be one body, it must needs remain as dead, having no life, neither death, nor corruption or incorruption. It's 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 obvious now to me that you know what he's saying is the opposition in things is the distinction between these two things, and that the elimination of distinction effectively eliminates the category. And I'm sure some philosophers have plenty to say about that. But uh, I think, again, it just sort of intuitively, I kind of get it. It's maybe not the most uh, logically uh, robust or, or detailed argument that he's making here. There's Neil A. Maxwell. He says, uh, without the existence of choices, without our freedom to choose and uh, without opposition, there would be no real existence. This is so much like Lehi's metaphor of how in the a a absence of agency and opposites, things have would resulted in a meaningless, undifferentiated compound in one. In such a situation, the earth would actually have no purpose in the end of its creation. It is a fact that we can grow, we can neither grow spiritually nor thereby be truly happy unless and until we make wise use of our moral agency. And so basically, Lehi is making this case that the need for opposition is going to bring about things to choose between and we need the ability to choose between things to grow. And that's the whole purpose of life is to grow and become more like God. And so if we don't have distinction, he, he goes through this a lot. I don't know. I feel like uh, I've, I've been speaking for too long. <laughs> and uh, maybe maybe I've tripped up over myself enough. So I'm, I'm happy to seed the time, seed some time to you. <laughs> well, he lays it out nicely that we have to be free to actually choose either one, right? If we're given a quote unquote choice, right? Make a choice, but you know what the right one is. That's not really a choice. When you tell your child like, well, you can either sit still or we're going home right now. That's not actually the choice they get to make, right? Those, that's a false dilemma. <laughs> well, yeah, because they're not, they have to be, one of the things he brings up is they have to both be appealing, mm -hmm. right? Yes, enticed. They have to be enticed by the one or the other. And I think also you can't say yes to something unless you are also allowed to say no to that thing, right? As you are always telling me when I am trying to decide whether I want to to say yes to something that has been asked of me, that if you ask someone yes or no, they have to be free to actually make either one of those decisions or it's not really a choice, right? And so that's why it's really important with agency that there is both good and evil in the world. We have to actually be able to choose one of those things at any given time, or not only can we not be accountable for the evil that we choose, if that's the only thing available, right? But we also can't be rewarded for choosing good if that's the only thing available. So that's why having opposition and difficulty in our lives brings forward this awareness of what's important to us and what we actually want. And that's why we, I also feel like agency is kind of on a continuum because there are lots of people who have way fewer choices in their life and have their options are so much more limited, which doesn't mean they don't have any accountability. They certainly do. But there are also people who have way more 
choices. And so they are much more accountable for what they do with that time. Think of the time that we have in leisure time to ourselves now versus people 150 years ago. Like they couldn't be held accountable for spending hours scrolling on social media because there also wasn't that option. So it's not that people back then were so much more moral than us because they don't spend any time on social media. That wasn't an option for them. And so I think we need to keep that in mind for ourselves as well to give ourselves grace and compassion that we are human just like everybody else. And all we have control over is is what we choose with the options that are given to us. We cannot always control the options that are given to us, but but we do get to choose between them. And, and we have the responsibility to try to do that wisely. Yes. Excellent. So between verse 13 and 14, we have these this pivot, right? Because he, starting at verse 11, this is sort of the, the negative spiral. It's, um call it a negative feedback loop, right? Where we have, you know, all things being a compound in one, it should be dead, it must be created for naught, there's no purpose, destroy God and his purposes. And then he says, if you, there's no law, there's no sin, there's no sin, there's no righteousness, no righteousness, no happiness, no righteousness or happiness, there's no punishment or misery. And if these things are, there's no God. Uh, and if there's no God, we are not. Neither the earth. There's no creation. There's nothing to act or be acted upon. So all things must have vanished away. And uh, that's about, about as bleak as you can get, right? That's the utter annihilationism. This is definitely the verse I would think of when, as the example of it not being perfectly logical. It's intuitive, but this is not a, again, not to say that it doesn't make sense. That's not what I mean, but that it's not a logical reason, according to Western philosophy, kind of uh, reasoned through logical argument. It's much more of a, an intuitive flow. Yes. And in fact, I think there is a name for this style of um, poetry, sorcerity, sorites. It's S-O-R-I-T-E-S, but that's a, a style of poetry where, you know, you're A, B, B, C, C, uh, A, B, B, C, C, D, D, E, et cetera, et cetera. There you go. Obviously, not in this case rhyming, but conceptually. <laughs> and so this uh, verse 14 is where we get this pivot where um, there's a little bit of a uh, tipping of the hand where Lehi says, uh, now my sons, right? That's like, uh, well, actually, I'm, I am speaking to all of you, even if he was kind of hinting at the temple service earlier. He's moved clearly from beyond um, Jacob's blessing to speaking to them for profit and learning. And of course, he's going to undo the uh, chain of negative feedback loop that he's been making with a positive feedback loop because there is a God, right? And he has created things, heavens and earth, all things in them, things to act and be acted upon to bring about eternal purposes, and, and et cetera, et cetera. And, and he's going to bring forth the the opposition, right? He's going to harken back to that. He's going to say the, the forbidden fruit in opposition to the tree of life, one being sweet and the other being bitter. It's interesting that this parallel that he brings in would suggest that the tree of life would be sweet and the forbidden fruit would be bitter. I think generally people would think that. But the way that he um, phrases it, you know, you have forbidden aligning with sweet and tree of life aligning with bitter, which is, I think, a subversion of your expectations in this case. I don't know about you, but for, for me, for sure. But the idea is, well, the tree of life has this promise of the future and children and Christ coming and life and all these things that are so wonderful, but it's bitter, right? Whereas the forbidden fruit has sort of some of these, you know, negative things about death and perishing and suffering, right? But it's sweet. And that contrasts again a little bit with his vision, right? Where he sees the, the tree of life and he describes it as the sweetest and the best and the white, whitest and brightest. And so I don't know. There, there's something there. I do want to posit this, that fruit is bitter when it is not yet ripe. And so perhaps... The fruit of the tree of life is bitter, not to everyone, but it was to Adam and Eve in the garden, or would have been had they been able to partake of it, because it wasn't ready. That was partaking of the tree of life would have meant judgment for them, would have meant their mortal lives were over. And they had not learned, they had not progressed enough, they were not prepared for that. That would have been partaking of unripe fruit. And so that would have made it bitter. 
And so perhaps, I mean, I don't think the two necessarily have to mesh well together, but if you wanted to try to mesh them together, I think that the tree of life in Lehi's vision, the fruit is sweet because it's ready now. It's ripe. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Verse 16, Wherefore the Lord God gave unto man that he should act for himself. Wherefore man could not act for himself, save it should be that he was enticed by the one or the other. They have to be, again, both appealing to people. That's that's a condition of agency, right? One of the many reasons that I suggest that uh, when it comes to the presidential election, we don't actually have a choice, right? Because one has to be enticing. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> or Actually, they both have to be enticing. <laughs> right. So, but uh, sk- skipping skipping over that, although we do we do get a little bit about the uh, the devil here, a little bit anachronistic, right, for us to get this sort of language, although not not perhaps entirely out of place. There's a, again a lot uh, that that we may cover in here, but uh, well, we're getting we're getting hints of of like the council in heaven, right, and a pre mortal mm-hmm. life. Which I don't think were were unknown, but certainly less emphasized, perhaps at that time. Yes, and there's uh, I think in chapter one there's the uh, the quote about you know I'll have soon soon I'll have to go all the way to the earth that some people have attributed to uh, Shakespeare, but actually parallels some ideas in Job, suggesting maybe you know the high had read Job or, or was aware of it and maybe in the brass plates and that. Uh, you know, Job is a, an interesting case study for, for Lehi, I imagine, given that Job lost all of his family, right, and all of his property. And, uh, you know, he um, did not have the greatest time. Well, the genre of Job, I mean, it could have been something that Lehi was aware of culturally that wouldn't wouldn't mm-hmm. have to be preserved on their records, you know, like that, that it was a like a fairy tale poem that was just sort of a well-known cultural story. Yeah, and so he may be drawing on some of these ideas still. But uh, we, we get that, you know, he, he points out that Adam and Eve partook of the forbidden fruit and they were driven out of the Garden of Eden to till the earth. I got to imagine still kind of he maybe has in his mind being driven out of Jerusalem, right? And while he didn't till the earth, he still had to eat raw meat and hunt and move his family. So Well, they had to live day to day, you know. Yeah, yeah. and they... Again, verse 20, they brought forth children, as he did. Verse 21, I think, is one of the most interesting sort of conceptual verses that the days of the children of men were prolonged, that they might repent well in the, fr- the flesh. Does that suggest that lifespans would have been much shorter had the plan gone a different way? Or does that suggest that the temporal existence of the age of the earth would have been much different, right? The children of men, the, the age of the children of men, uh, so to speak. I, I'm not sure, but um, I think that's an interesting phrase. Do you have the 1828 Merriam-Webster handy? Can I ask you to look up a word in that? I can. Can you look up probation? Sure thing. Trial, examination, proceeding to design to ascertain truth. Um, this is sort of like a university exam. In a monastic sense, trial or year of the novitiate, uh, which a person must pass in a convent. Also a moral trial, the state of man in his present life. In general, trial for proof or satisfactory evidence or the time of trial itself. Right. Well, I just think that in our modern conception of probation, it sound, it's very negative, right? <laughs> and it would have, I think at the time, it probably would have been more neutral. You know, it would have just been like trial period, you know? Yeah. So saying that the Adam and Eve were on probation, it, it just meant you're, you're waiting to see, right? You are withholding judgment <laughs> that, that we're just waiting and seeing. What? I, I'm sorry. Now, I now all I can think of is uh, Adam and Eve being brought into the dean's office and being informed that they're on double secret probation. <laughs> and I know you don't get that reference. It's Animal House, but uh, that I, that just oh boy. A listener or two might get that. <laughs> uh, assuming that makes the cut. <laughs> yeah. And then, well, further in that verse, it said, "For he gave commandment that all men must repent. For he showed." unto all men that they were lost because of the transgression of their parents. And this use of lost to me is is the purest sense of lost, not in like lost forever, but like wandering, like don't really know where they are, right? Mm-hmm. Have lost all of their reference points, you know? And and not like, you know, fell over the side of a cliff, cliff lost, our euphemism for died, 
I just, um, I want to take away that desperation sometimes we get when we think of like lost sheep. And I think that there is lots of time that that doesn't take away our responsibility to take action, right? And to reach out to people like we need to be engaged. But at the same time, I, I don't think that we need to be feverish and anxiety ridden by having to save the people around us. We don't need to save anyone. That is our Heavenly Parents project. They invite us yes. to participate with them to change our hearts, but we're not saving anyone. And none of them are lost to our Heavenly Parents. Nobody is lost to them. They know where all of us are, both physically and spiritually. And that I, I think that that gives me a lot of peace thinking about the time span that our heavenly parents are working with, not just being this life, but it being so much longer and grander than that, that the scheme of the Lord's work and glory is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. And that that is so much broader than our mortal lives here. Not Again, not that our mortal lives aren't important or the decisions that we make aren't important, but we can lay aside that frenzy of having to make everything right this side of the veil. There is time and space for that in our Heavenly Parents plan. I think that's an interesting thought to bring up because we are going to get into uh, Jacob later. And of course, Jacob is, is very famously, you know, labored all his days that he can cleanse his garments from the blood and sins of the generation, which the idea I think is still, I think those are compatible ideas, even though if they, they might seem at first to be separate, but I think it, it comes down to recognizing what it is that you are putting your effort into uh, versus what it is that you are trusting to be taken care of. Again, here we, we have some, uh, doctrinal important notes that men were lost because of the transgression of their parents, right? Not the sin. We have that little connection, which is, I mean, we have a lot of thoughts about that. I don't know that we can get into all of them. <laughs> the state of probation and their time was lengthened according to the commandments, which the Lord God gave unto the children of men. I don't know what all commandments he means there, right? The only commandment that Lehi mentions, as far as I remember, was to repent. So I'm curious if there's more that he means there or or what exactly this phrase um, is suggesting and in, um, in reading the various commentaries that uh, was not was not clarified more. I'll say that much. Verse 22, we get this idea again of the compounded one that, you know, if Adam had not transgressed, he would not have fallen. He'd remain in the Garden of Eden. All things were would remain in the same state and they would remain forever and had no end. So just sort of a neutral non-existence. In light of that, in verse 23, it seems almost like a logical, and so therefore they would have had no children. And that that makes me think of not just the powers of procreation, but if things can't change, there is no such thing as conception and pregnancy and delivery. That requires dynamism. That, that requires being able to change and shift and things not being how they were. And so if things can't change, like if a woman's body can't change, she cannot carry a baby. Yeah. So they couldn't have had children because there was no... So to me, that that's much greater and broader than just the procreative powers, right? They, they wouldn't have had children because there wasn't space for that type of growth and change. There was no moving from one state to another. It almost reminds me of how people who deal with severe depression, sometimes we think of depression as like being sad, right? And that is one definition. But a lot of people who deal with extreme levels of depression actually report it as being a sort of numbness or like a non-feeling, right? That they just, it's a anhedonism, I think it might be. Uh, again, I'm maybe exposing my ignorance in terms of uh, linguistics, but anhedonia maybe may, might be the, the right term, but yes. it's a complete lack of feeling, right? And so again, we have having no joy for they knew no misery, doing no good for they knew no sin, right? This this idea that they just are almost like robots, right? With no feeling and no ability to grow and change. 24, big, big sort of wind up. But behold, all things have been done in the wisdom of him and all, all things. And then 25 is the real home run. Adam fell that men might be and men are that they might have joy. Just a beautiful stanza and poetic, intuitive, and a perfect central thesis on which to focus this whole chapter. 
I also love that verse. I think we have to be careful not to weaponize it and make it sound like you are made to have joy. Therefore, if you're feeling sad, you're not doing what you were meant to do. <laughs> yes. So not that most they people might take have it that joy. Way. Right, right, right. Well, and that joy is a is not happy. Joy is not an emotion. Happiness. It's joy can coexist with grief, with sorrow, and joy is a permeating attitude about the world around you, right? So it's it's something that can be cultivated, but that doesn't cancel or erase sadness or sorrow or grief, you know? And so I, I, I do think it's important for us to, we're, we're not going to do this toxic positivity thing where, where men are that they might have joy. So just be happy, just smile and it's fine. I think it does mean that we do have an understanding of the possibility of joy, right? Yes. And that, again, the, the fall being a good thing is, as far as I know, there's only a handful of theologians who, who took that stance. And uh, even in Joseph's day, I think there were a handful, but it obviously is not now and wasn't then an incredibly popular doctrine. Uh, so for, for Lehi to expound this, I think, is um, important. There's an interesting thought in verse 26 that he says, The Messiah cometh in the fullness of times that he may redeem the children of men from the fall. And because they are redeemed from the fall, they have become free forever, knowing good from evil, to act for themselves and not to be acted upon, save it be by the punishment of the law of the great and last day, according to the commandments of which God hath given. This is something that I think when, you know, there, there's been a handful of apostles who have sort of suggested like, well, actually, agency is more about the ability to choose good, right? It's to choose the right thing. But again, there needing to be an opposition and the possibility for you to choose others. It's so interesting that there seems to be a conditional that we're only able to act after being redeemed from the fall, right? Mm. But I think what it may what it may be referencing is that the resurrection is actually the mechanism by which we become free forever, knowing good from evil to act upon it, which is strange. And I'm not sure that's correct, but I'm not sure how else to interpret it. Because is the Messiah coming in the fullness of, of time that he may redeem the children of men from the fall. Obviously, we talked about two effects from the fall. We've got physical death and spiritual death. And being redeemed from the fall, they become free forever. So is it possible that what he's saying here is, well, actually, one of the other conditions that we need to understand about agency is the idea that to know good from evil and all of these things, we actually have to have a consequence to this all, that we have to have a future, right? We can't just be arbitrarily choosing good for no eventual result. Well, and also that the, there are always consequences, right, for, for the good and evil that we choose, but they are not always immediate. In fact, they mm -hmm. are often delayed. And that is, that's kind of the point actually, is that if choosing good always got you an immediate reward, everybody would choose good for the reward and not on its own merit. Or if you always got punished every time you chose something bad, like that's, that's not actually, you're free to choose, but like it follows so quickly that you're just trained in a very childish way, maybe even just by mm -hmm. instinct, mm -hmm. like you would train a dog kind of thing, such, yeah. such immediate rewards. But if the consequence which is never is never taken away, but delayed, you actually are more free to choose things based on their own merit. And so maybe what he's saying is, because we're redeemed from the fall, they created some space, that probationary mm. state, right? Some space for us to between the choice and the consequence mm. that allows us to act for ourselves and not then be immediately acted upon, right? By you know, the laws of gravity then, or, or whatever, you know, that <laughs> whatever natural law. Right. Right. So obviously there are things that do have immediate consequences, but who among us has not looked at someone who has made radically different choices from us. And we feel like I've always tried to be good. I've always tried to choose the right and look where it has led me. Look where it's mm. gotten me. And I, I don't think there's a single one of us who hasn't felt that at some point in their life. I think that's pretty natural. But that's where our faith comes in. That's that's part of the philosophical problem of evil, right? Is that evil people get good consequences all the time. And good people get bad consequences all the time. And why does that happen? And I, I think it's because 
the atonement opened up that space between every choice having an immediate consequence. That's a very interesting thought that I really, really like. 27, he, he sums up the the options. We got a little, you know, dichotomy. We've got if men are free according to the flesh, they're free to choose liberty and eternal life through the great mediator of all men or choose captivity and death according to the captivity and power of the devil. So we have the contrast of, um, I think it's my dad always said, uh, you got immortality and eternal life or immorality and eternal strife. Those are, those are the two <laughs> options, right, that you, you got to choose between. I think it's an interesting ex- exercise anywhere in the Book of Mormon, but especially in this verse, as I was reading it, it struck me, the punctuation for the Book of Mormon, which was inserted by the printer. There was not any punctuation in the manuscript given to the printer for the Book of Mormon. And so the, the printer just made logical decisions about how to punctuate this. And if you change the punctuation in these verses, it can really change a lot of the meanings or mm. how it lays it out. And so I would challenge the listener, if you got if you got a little bit of time, like write down a verse or two of these without the punctuation and see where you would put that in and see if that changes some things for you. Because in verse 27, I just being a, a natural copy editor by trade, but I, I was coming through this verse, wherefore men are free according to the flesh and all things are given them which are expedient unto man. I would put a comma between them and which, making that second sentence, all things are given unto them, comma, which are expedient unto man. Meaning all those things are expedient. Give, giving them is the expedient, not the things. Mm. Giving them is the expedient thing. So we are given all things and that is good and right. And then that makes us free to choose liberty and eternal life. So anyway, just an hmm. example of how shifting some of the punctuation can change your understanding of it. And again, there's a good resource, bookofmormon.online, which uh, people can go to. And one of the things that you can turn on is uh, Skousen's various commentaries on the Book of Mormon. But he is specifically approaching it from the idea of the text and examining various Ways that we, you know, the text has been updated and altered, including punctuation, including punctuation in the RLDS uh, editions or, or the Church of Christ, as I think they, Community they go by of now. Christ. Community of Christ, mm-hmm. um, as they go by now. But at the time when it was published, it was Church of Christ, or it was a, actually it was RLDS. So, but it's interesting that sometimes, you know, commas get lost and other things get inserted. And so I think that that is a very interesting undertaking. And there's a handful of times where he makes recommendations as to this, well this should be restored to you know what what was original and he is I, generally the idea is he is advocating for returning to as close as the um, printer's manuscript as, as we have but uh, uh, unless we have you know overwhelming evidence that Joseph really meant something else but I don't know that he's necessarily advocating for that for the church but so that we move towards the original dictation of the Book of Mormon as closely as possible so We've got verse 28, uh, where we get more injunctions. You know, Lehi says, you know, look, hearken, be, choose. All these great verbs that he's that he's desiring for his children. And again, this is an emotional appeal that he's making to them. I think it's really beautiful that his his ending words of this sermon are, and I have none other object save it be the everlasting welfare of your souls. And just just a reminder that, that it's his pure love as a parent that is motivating him to speak about these things. He doesn't have any other motive. It's just because he loves them. A reminder that that's, that's also God's motive, that our, our heavenly parents are doing everything that they're doing because they love us. Well, I think that's, uh, that's all for this week. That's all. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I just want to thank the editors for all of their hard work, especially dealing with some of my uh, linguistic challenges. Please make sure to rate and review the the podcast on your podcast platform of choice and uh, subscribe so that you don't miss an episode. And uh, tell your friends about our discussions. Uh, If you'd like to get involved in the Latter-day Peace Studies Project, please join the Facebook group, Latter-day Nonviolence, Pacifism, and Peace Studies. We've got links in the show notes. Please make sure to check out the Get Involved page on our website, latterdaypeacestudies.org. 
go to the get involved page and scroll down to the donate button. You can contribute regularly or just once to co- help us cover the cost of web hosting and podcasting. So for Latter-day Peace Studies, I'm Marianne. And I'm Dan. See you next week.